The Thomas, Thomas Starzl, known as the father of transplantation, began one of the first clinically relevant kidney transplant programs back in 1962. He performed the first human liver transplant in 1963. He received the nation's highest honor for scientific achievement, the Medal of Science, in 2005. In honoring his distinguished career and celebrating his pioneering contributions to the field, we have named today's lecture the Thomas Starzl State of the Art Presentation. I'm very pleased to introduce Martine Rothblatt as the Thomas Starzl State of the Art presenter, speaking on creating the first life-saving Xeno heart transplanted into a person. Martine Rothblatt is the chairperson and CEO of United Therapeutics Consortium Corporation. She started UT to save her youngest child's life from a rare illness after having previously created Sirius XM satellite radio and other satellite communication systems. She is also responsible for several innovations in aviation and architecture, including the design and piloting of an electric helicopter to Guinness World Records and creating the world's largest zero carbon footprint building. Her company is now saving hundreds of lives a year with medicines for pulmonary hypertension and neuroblastoma and by restoring otherwise discarded donor lungs to transplantability. United Therapeutics is also in pre-clinical development of manufactured kidneys, hearts, and lungs to be delivered via autonomously flown electric vertical takeoff and landing systems. Dr. Rothblatt led the efforts to create the first genetically modified porcine hearts and kidneys transplanted into humans, resulting in life-saving Xeno heart transplant in January of 2022. Dr. Rothblatt earned her PhD in medical ethics from the Royal London College of Medicine and Dentistry after earning a JD and an MBA degree from the UCLA. She recently also was awarded the UCLA medal, its highest honor. She is an inventor on several patents and the author of several books, the most recent of which pertain to artificial cognition and cyber consciousness. Please join me in giving a fantastic welcome to Dr. Martine Rothblatt. Wow, thank you so much for that uh, most generous introduction. I really appreciate it. And it is an immense honor for me to be here with all of you today um, providing this Thomas Starzl lecture. My effort to create the first Xeno Heart began with my quest to create an unlimited supply of transplantable organs and um, that was really done so that my daughter, my youngest daughter, who is afflicted with pulmonary arterial hypertension could get one when needed. My literature research had revealed no instance of pulmonary hypertension reoccurring after a lung or heart lung transplant, but the same research showed that most patients died before they could get such a transplant. Pulmonary hypertension patients represent just barely 10% of lung transplant recipients, which in the US meant about 200 such transplants per year. However, with the disease's mean mortality around five years and its prevalence at about 50,000 people, there would always be several hundred who could not be saved with donor lungs. I made my first priority developing better medicines for pulmonary hypertension to keep my daughter alive longer, thus buying me more time to solve the organ gap. We now have five FDA approved medicines for pulmonary hypertension, so that strategy is working pretty good. And my daughter works today in United Therapeutics, helping all of us help everyone else 
with pulmonary hypertension. I investigated what I could do to increase organ donations, but already 50% of Americans are organ donors. So doubling the number of donors would not come close to closing the tenfold gap on needed organs for pulmonary hypertension. I remembered from my youth that my grandmother, an immigrant from Ukraine, received a porcine heart valve due to the good size match of a pig and human heart. Since Dolly the sheep had just been cloned and the human genome had just been sequenced, I thought a good one, two, three solution would be one, sequence the pig genome, two, modify enough pig genes to establish human tolerability for its organs, and three, clone the gene-modified pigs to produce enough organ transplants for everyone. But just as I hit on this approach, the world slapped a moratorium on porcine xenografts for fear of creating a pig virus pandemic. We were still in the midst of the AIDS crisis, and this caution seemed reasonable, if not premature. I thought that my first contribution to creating an unlimited supply of xenografts would be to come up with an ethical algorithm that both protected the public and enabled xenotransplantation to proceed. This I did in a PhD dissertation under England's leading medical ethicist at the Royal College of Medicine and Dentistry. The title of the thesis and the book ultimately published from it was Your Life or Mine, How Geoethics Can Resolve the Conflict Between Public and Private Interests in Xenotransplantation. As the title implies, the ethical algorithm balanced the public's concern not to face a new pandemic, your life, with the patient's concern not to die from their disease, my life. Key elements of the algorithm were one, a so-called Ulysses algorithm, or I'm sorry, Ulysses contract signed with the patients, which are kind of non-withdrawable informed consents to comply with infection control procedures. Two, breeding the pigs to foreclose the possibility of transmissible pathogens or pathogenic viral sequences, and three, a commitment to biosurveillance. The dissertation done and the book out, I began looking for teams to help me implement the biotechnology strategy. My first stop was one of the scientists whose work I had cited extensively in my thesis. Those citations were perhaps not surprising, as I think he is in the Guinness Book of World Records for having the most peer-reviewed medical publications, something like 2,500, and at some points in his life, about one publication a day. I was introduced by, to Tom Starzl by our mutual friend, hepatitis B discoverer and Nobel laureate Barry Blumberg, who seated us together at an American Philosophical Society dinner, and we talked until well past midnight. Tom explained to me about his findings in microchimerism, about the ability to achieve transplant tolerance via antigen induction into immunologically privileged biospaces, and about a small struggling company he had got UPMC to financially support just for a little while called Revivacor that had successfully knocked out the key porcine gene causing hyperacute rejection. At places like this rooftop of his Pittsburgh office, Tom would explain to me with great excitement the whole bioanthropology story of why we humans lacked alpha galactosidase and viscerally bio-revolted when we saw those on organ or donor grafts saw those sugars on donor grafts. He urged me to buy 
and use Revivacor as a company vehicle for my strategic dream. And my company did exactly that. Growing up in Los Angeles, West Los Angeles at that, I was not familiar with pigs. But on my very first visit to Revivacor, I took a fancy to them. I learned at Revivacor that they had already begun the process of getting FDA approval um, for alpha-gal knockout pork. Since there were many people, actually hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people, with a bad meat allergy called alpha-gal syndrome caused by a bite from the Lone Star Tick. They were all fully on board for a moonshot effort to edit additional genes until we had an animal that could provide us with tolerable vital organs. But which genes? How many could be realistically edited in the time frame that I needed to save patients running out of time on our own pharmaceutical medicines? I decided to convene a small tiger team of experts and work with them to agree on a disciplined, differential gene editing program by which we could march through 8 to 12 agreed genes based on already published research in not longer than about 10 years. Now, why 8 to 12? Because given the time needed for editing, cloning, gestation, growth, and testing, not more than this number of genes could be sequentially processed in under 10 years. Contracts with two organizations were able to help keep us on schedule. One contract was with Robin Pearson's lab at the University of Maryland to test our genetically engineered lungs in an ex vivo lung perfusion rig for at least a few hours. While this is not as good a course as a prolonged in vivo test, it did give us a quick read on gene choices via transcriptomic data. The other contract was with Craig Fentner's new company, Synthetic Genomics. They provided us with porcine sequencing at a far higher level of resolution than previously existed, as well as sophisticated gene engineering expertise. The team of experts I tried to corral into providing a step-by-step -step logical progression of gene edits consisted of David Cooper, Robin Pearson, Ifan Dai, and David Ayers. I was trying to gain additional weeks of baboon graft recipient survival by adding the right additional genes. If a gene didn't add survival, then I wanted to drop it in favor of another logical to try gene. This is one of several charts that uh, resulted from our brainstorming sessions. You will notice that human von Willebrand factor appears a lot because we were quite worried about clotting. While we did test HVWF, as shown in this chart, they made no discernible difference in survival. In actual practice, we ended up with a 10-gene xenograph resulting from dozens of experiments in which the differential gene edit was the independent variable and baboon survival was the dependent variable. Many things we assumed or theoretically thought would make sense were disproven by these actual experiments. Now, using testing in machines and baboons takes up to two years to complete from the date that each pig version becomes available. This slide shows that combining the pig genetic engineering schedule and about two years for testing in machines and baboons, it takes perseverance over several years to achieve a pig with eight or so genetic modifications. One whose organs might have achieved enough months of baboon survival to justify readiness for human use. I think the greatest challenge in creating this 10-gene heart we're speaking about today was that we had to adopt new independent variables, the gene edits, based on very little data from the dependent variables, such as baboon survival. 
I would sometimes get cognitive whiplash from going between our pharmaceutical development teams who don't want to make a decision on anything without a large N experiment and a statistically significant p-value, and our Xeno development teams who want to make decisions based on outcomes in two or three baboons that could not possibly be statistically significant. However, the drug discovery method simply would not work for the Xeno heart discovery challenge. So we had to sniff, bump, and feel our way through the murky Xeno statistics as best we could. Now the Xeno heart problem is greatly worsened by the fact that there are a lot of possible genes to try, and it turns out to matter a great deal, not only which genes you tried, but where you placed them in the genome, and which other genes and coding regions they were adjacent to. The problem seemed almost insurmountably complex and nonlinear. Fortunately, we had identified ideally suited genetic landing pads within the porcine genome, in which to place optimally constructed cassettes of a few edited genes as a group. I think a good analogy is that before you land a spacecraft on a moon or planet, it is very wise to first have excellent surveillance of the surface area so that you pick a level place to land. Another Apollo analogy we used was the so-called all-up approach. There was not time in the 10 years President John F. Kennedy gave Werner Von Braun and Jim Webb's um, teams to land a man on the moon and safely return him back to Earth to test each critical rocket launch element separately. So they had to test several risky technologies together as a group, realizing that in the event of failure, it could be hard to isolate which element of the group caused the fault, but Kennedy gave them only 10 years. There was no other way to get it done in that time period. We copied this Apollo all-up approach because of similar time constraints and similarly used cassettes of several gene edits at once to achieve our goal. Once we were able to appreciate the porcine genome at a high enough resolution, we were able to design an optimal gene cassette and landing pad docking strategy that streamlined away a great many gene expression variables, not the least of which were those that affected reproductive fecundity. After much trial and error, by 2018, we noticed that our results were diverging for, diff for different organs. Our baboon kidney and heart transplants were gaining weeks and even months with each additional rightly chosen gene edit, while our lungs were still failing at just a couple weeks past gal knockout enabled surpassing of hyperacute rejection. So we decided to split lungs off of our xenotransplantation program and to add in one more gene for hearts and kidneys with the specific goal of stopping the relentless growth that the porcine organs underwent in the baboon models. The program split with our Xeno efforts focused on hearts and kidneys, while our lung effort went in the direction of allocellularized scaffolds produced in our laboratories to avoid the heightened immunosensitivity caused by the innate immune system's special dominance in the lung. This allocellularization program is proceeding quite well, but would require its own separate presentation. Nevertheless, I'm very pleased to share with you that just last week, we debuted our latest 3D printed lung, which it turns out is the most complex 3D printed object of any sort, anywhere, ever. The one last gene we added for xeno hearts and xeno kidneys was inspired by the isolated population of people with Larone syndrome. We decided to add one more knockout, 
This one unrelated to alpha galactose and the two porcine sugar androgens we had knocked out, but instead a knockout for the growth hormone receptor so that the xenografts would not grow to the huge size of a typical pig organ. Lerone syndrome is an autosomal, autosomal recessive disorder characterized by a lack of insulin growth factor production in response to growth hormone. It is usually caused by an inherited growth hormone receptor mutation. Now, people with Lerone's condition have a significantly reduced risk of cancer and diabetes, as well as a delayed onset of other age-related diseases, which, of course, we would all love to see mapped into our xeno hearts and xeno kidneys. The story of Lerone syndrome is actually quite fascinating. It seems that the mutation arose among Jewish populations in biblical Judea who were expelled by their Roman overlords in the first century of the Common Era. It is likely that the Lerone's individuals were sent to Spain as slaves, a wealthy Roman province, but kept intramarrying. When the Spanish Inquisition arose in 1492, most Jews converted to Catholicism, or at least pretended to, and some of those so-called conversos emigrated to the New World during the following century. Once there, an extended family of Lerone's individuals set up homesteads in a rural part of what is now Ecuador, likely to avoid violent discrimination they would face in urban areas. Gene sequencing has now revealed their 2,000-year journey. And I jokingly tell some of my Semitic uh, friends who are worried about taking a xenograph to not worry because, at least poetically or bioanthropologically, our xenographs have roots in the lands that gave us the concepts of kosher and halal. In summary, we created the 10 gene heart based on trial and error over a decade, with hundreds of gene constructs made and well over 100 uh, experiments carried out. Three of our knockouts address preformed antibodies against non-primate sugars that give rise to hyperacute rejection. Two knock-ins down-regulate complement cascade associated with acute rejection. Two knock-ins temper coagulation. And two knock-ins either cloak or minimize immune system-related inflammatory activity associated with chronic rejection. Roughly speaking, it took us about one year per gene to create this 10-gene pig. Now that we had the ideal Xeno heart, who was going to transplant it? Xeno transplantation requires a merging of surgical and, immu and immunological skill sets. The world's most experienced Xeno heart immunologist was Dr. Mohammed Mahouadine, shown here embraced with my right arm. So we readily agreed to his proposal for us to support his team's transition from NIH to UMB. After all, no one had kept baboons living longer with Xeno hearts heterotopically than had he, and his close connections to the techniques of the Munich transplant group gave us confidence that he could replicate his results orthotopically. One of the most experienced uh, heart and lung transplant surgeons, Bart Griffith of UMB, shown with my thumbs up, had been our principal investigator since we set up a multi-year program at UMB with its former chief surgeon, Steve Bartlett. And integral to everything is the president of our xenotransplantation subsidiary, Revivacor, David Ayers, shown under my left arm. Then, on January 7th of this year, we were ready to put all of the pieces together. 10 years of step-by-step, -step, meticulous, and often frustrating efforts to modify a magnificent work of nature, the porcine genome, had culminated in a tolerable 10-gene xenoheart. When this marvel of biology and biotechnology was complicated, was complemented by Kinetza's new anti-CD40 immunotherapy and preconditioned with ex vivo steam solution-enriched heart box, the tolerability achieved its needed belt and suspenders. Finally, when placed into too large of a chest cavity in a morbidly individual, ill individual with exquisite surgical skill by Bart Griffith, we had the makings 
of a historic success. But there were yet more pieces to put together. The extraordinary patient care team of intensivists at UMB, the lawyers, ethicists, and financialists who had the mind meld with the FDA and the hospital's administration, and of course, the multiply validated consent of an amazingly brave patient, Mr. David Bennett Sr. There is no way to know if we could have made a better heart in the allotted time. But to paraphrase Voltaire, often the better is the enemy of the good. This 10 gene heart seems to work very well. And I feel that our main job now is to complete all of the remaining processes and procedures to achieve regulatory approval for general availability. One big part of these upcoming processes and procedures is to create a designated pathogen-free production plant for all of the xeno hearts and xeno kidneys. The xeno hearts and xeno kidneys we transplanted in late 2021 by doctors Jamie Locke and uh, Bob Montgomery at UAB and NYU respectively, and then Dr. Griffith as just mentioned at UMB. They came from pilot plant versions of this architect's conception of our commercial scale facility. We are currently building a clinical scale production facility in Virginia as a stepping stone to this zero carbon footprint uh, product launch facility planned for North Carolina. The xenograft delivery model is actually very different from that with human donor organs. Instead of organs coming from anywhere and going to anywhere, and let me put in a plug here that if you have lungs, it's good to send them to our ex vivo lung perfusion facility and the sister facility at the Mayo Jacksonville before transplanting them. This is the current distribution model. At United Therapeutics, we will produce all of the organs in just one location where we can best maintain all of the animal welfare, GMP quality control, and pathogen-free quality assurance requirements necessary for an FDA-approved biologic. Consequently, we will fly out all of the produced organs to major transplant hospitals on the schedule that each surgical team requests from a single location and deliver them directly to the transplant OR. As this map shows, we can do this well within standard UNOS delivery times. This picture here um, it was taken just a week ago, and it shows our organ delivery aircraft flying over the famous Huffman Prairie Field, where the Wright brothers did most of all of their initial trials after Kitty Hawk and before they became famous. Indeed, just last week, we test flew with the FAA's approval our all-electric organ delivery aircraft over 1,000 nautical miles from Plattsburgh, New York to Bentonville, Arkansas. New liquid hydrogen-powered fuel cell technology gives electric aircraft ranges comparable to planes flying with jet fuel. The tail number of this aircraft, UT-250, I'm sorry, 250 Uniform Tango, UT, proclaims its mission of delivering organs for United Therapeutics with a zero carbon range of 250 nautical miles. Bob Montgomery asked me to speak today about what it took to create the first life-saving Xenoheart. It took way more than a village. The foundation of what it took was decades of peer-reviewed molecular biology research by hundreds of scientists and research associates more than I can ever name. But just by way of example, to demonstrate the caliber of this amazing collective of research experts, I mean research published by the likes of David Sachs, David Cooper, and Megan Sykes. Then it took the combined science and art of genetic engineered animal husbandry it is not easy to meaningfully modify something as hyper-complex as a pig without actually breaking a thing or two. And breaking pig genomes is not going to lead to xenotransplantation success. While the peer-reviewed xeno research could guide us in what to do, it could not tell us how to do it. Here we must pay homage 
to the generations of scientists and animal care experts who have learned how to edit genes, clone animals, and breed genetically modified mammals like the pig. Again, there are hundreds if not thousands of people that should be credited, but just by way of example, I want to point out Emmanuel Charpentier, Jennifer Dudna, Ian Wilmot, and David Ayers. Once we had figured out how to do what we've been advised by research to do, we then had to confirm whether or not we had done it right. We had to test the hypotheses. This involved careful laboratory te testing. Both ex vivo, as Robin Pearson led the way, and even in vivo, as indiv individuals such as Mohammed Mohuddin, Lars Berdoff, and the Munich Group have led the way. More recently, in the months before the Xeno heart transplant, Bob Montgomery and his team at NYU and Jamie Locke and her team at UAB further led the way. And again, all of these are simply exemplary names for more animal model transplanters than I would have time or ability to recount. Along this entire process, we had two vital forces that kept us moving from the base of this 10-gene pyramid to the 10-gene Xeno heart in Mr. Bennett Sr. at the top. First, there was an unrelenting commitment on the part of so many people to make Xeno happen. I used to bristle at the comment that Xeno would always be the future of medicine because it seemed to discount our efforts, or that Xeno was like an onion with unlimited layers to unpeel. As that seemed to discount the scientific process. The commitment of so many researchers to letting nothing stand in our way is a huge part of what propelled us from basic research to life-saving Xenoheart. When I think of such unrelenting commitment to improving transplant medicine, I think of my mentors, Tom Starzl and Sir Magdi Yacoub. Finally, nothing like a life-saving Xenoheart could have been achieved without immense amounts of good faith, mutual, scientific collaboration. We owe this success as much as anything to the cooperation of Conexa in providing an anti-CD40 drug supply, and to Ex Vivo of Sweden in providing Steen Cardiac Solution and a post-explant heart box. If you add up all the contributors in this pyramid and its ramparts, I think you will see that the first ever life-saving Xeno Heart was a creation of thousands of people across many decades and dozens of organizations. The patient, David Bennett Sr., whose heart model is under my left hand, thanked Dr. Griffith, Dr. Ayers, and Dr. Mahuadi for giving him a chance to live and enjoy his family and passions. But I thank the patient for giving us, the transplantation community, a chance to save the lives of thousands of more patients in this very decade of the 2020s. And I thank all of you at this Transplant Congress for all you do year in, year out, to make life extension with good quality life a visceral reality for countless tens of thousands of patients today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The, um